Before texting, before internet, and to viewers young enough not to remember a time before even email existed, telecommunication went through many stages of advancement. In the days before cell phones and email, our quickest way to send news or catch up with friends and family was the good old-fashioned telephone, usually mounted on the kitchen wall or sitting on a bedside table. The hard plastic base with its rotary dial and its handheld handset sat there until we felt compelled to reach out and touch someone and talk we did that a lot. We tied up that one phone line shared by everyone in the house until the fighting began and mom yelled at everyone to go outside until dinner. Upon which time, she would grab the phone and call the other moms to complain about kids these days. When I was a kid, I remember calling to talk to a friend, oftentimes a girl, just praying that her parents wouldn't answer and of course, they would, often the dad, and you'd be forced to sit there and chat with the parent until the kid that you wanted to talk to got to the phone. And they'd ask you questions like, how's school? What are you doing this weekend? What are you gonna be talking to my daughter about? And who remembers the nights and weekends discounts for long distance calling, waiting until 7 p.m. to save that 20 cents per minute, which was well worth it at the time because minimum wage was $1.30 an hour. Before my time, we sent letters by post mail, paper, pen, envelope, stamp, and you send it. Perfume and X's and O's on the paper were optional. But earlier than that, most of us stumble on the history of how we communicated with each other. Telegrams, telegraphs, wires, and wireless transmitters. It all becomes kind of a blur. Today on History See, we're going to talk about the history of Morse code, electric telegraphs, and the gigantic leap forwards in telecommunications. We'll talk about laying the first transatlantic cables and a historic first that connected entire continents with near instant communication, but not without many obstacles and a few injuries along the way. Hi, I'm Tim, and this is History Sea, where we dive into the history of all things related to the sea and sailing and maritime travel. Now, the word telecommunication comes from the Greek prefix tele, meaning distant, and communicare, meaning to share. As a species, we rely on communication for our very survival. Think the weather, incoming invasions by another army, the changes in rulers and dynasties. For our ancestors, staying informed wasn't merely to watch political mud-throwing, like we mostly think of today as news. It was critical at the time to help you decide to keep or sell off some land, to marry your kids off in a way that might profit you, and above all, to defend your town against the next town down the road. The slow evolution of telecommunication began with issuing smoke signals, beating drums, and eventually moved on to waving flags using semaphores. A semaphore is like a giant, very complicated flagpole that sometimes even had lights on it. Trains still use them. Each new method of communication with our friends or enemies was a step forward, but at this point, it was always hindered by the requirement that the sender and the receiver have a shared understanding of what's meant by each puff of smoke, each drum rhythm or tempo, or each flag movement, so it wasn't incredibly efficient or detailed when you did get the message. These methods were also limited to very close range of proximity, so spreading the word far and wide wasn't really a possibility for quite some time. Letters sent by men on horseback were the most reliable way to deliver news. However, this too was fraught with the possibility of failure, failure due to weather or highway robbery or plain old poor navigation skills. If you saw the History Sea episode on the Erie Canal, you'll remember that when it was finally opened, they used cannon fire to signal it to everyone. First, a cannon near Buffalo fired and then one a few miles east of that, and then another, and another, until finally the last cannon down on the Hudson fired. And so, as we humans are prone to do, we progressed. 
Finally, around the early 1800s, things started to heat up a little bit. We couldn't figure out how to transmit words or sentences or even pictures, but we did figure out how to transmit electricity, electrical signals. We knew how to push a button in one location and have that button send an electrical signal down a wire to make a sound in another location. And if we could do that, we just had to figure out how to make a sound make sense to someone else. In 1837, Samuel Morse joined with Alfred Vail and came up with the now famous Morse code, a way of spelling out a specific message that could be deciphered easily and translated by those sounds. A short sound was a dot, a long sound was a dash. Dots and dashes translated into text in a standardized way. Soon, operators could tap out these dots and dashes very quickly across electrical wires on the newly dubbed electrical telegraph, also created by the genius duo of Samuel Morse and Alfred Vail. But history, as usual, has different opinions on whether Morse and Vail developed the electric telegraph first, or whether the Brits, William Fothergill Cook and Charles Wheatstone, beat them to the punch. Regardless, the electric telegraph was born, and a new era of communication was about to change everything. Hey, while we're talking about communication, here's a reminder that History this very 21st century YouTube episode about communication, is made possible by patrons. I invite you to pitch in a couple of bucks per episode if you find value in learning about maritime history. Also, clicking that subscribe button below and liking this video. It really helps me a lot. I couldn't do it without you. Here's what history looks like in Morse code, in case you were wondering. In 1844, the first telegraph line was opened officially, sending a message from Washington, D.C. all the way to Baltimore. It doesn't seem like far today, but it was a big deal back then. And they sent, the, and I quote, What hath God wrought? At the blazing speed of 30 characters per minute. This news of advancement in communication caught on very quickly, and telegraph lines were strung across all of the United States by 1850, connecting urban areas. Soon after, other countries followed suit, connecting their bigger cities, stringing squiggly lines across all of the land. In 1852, at a time when a letter from California took 10 days to reach New York, if it reached it, News events within a continent were now shared by electrical telegraph within minutes. This leap in telecommunications was giant, and it didn't take long before we started asking the most ubiquitous human question, what's next? To this point, telegraphs were constrained by the vast seas that separated the masses of land that we live on. Cables at the time were strung on poles, sunk into the dirt. Was it even possible to consider the idea of telecommunications across oceans. It didn't take long for the scientific community to take up that challenge. How to lay a telegraph cable across the ocean floor? How to even make cables both strong enough and long enough to reach over 2,000 miles? And maybe the most challenging of it all, even if the cables were constructed to be submerged unfathomable depths, how could we somehow make them long enough to bridge, say, North America to Europe? And how then would you even physically be able to string the line across thousands of nautical miles over the Earth's harshest terrain? And all this in a time when steam engine ships were still exploding all the time. First, let's talk about these cables. These cables were no lightweight thing. When electric telegraph cables were finally manufactured to be permanently submerged in water, they had to be carefully considered and made well enough to do the job of transmitting sign signals and defending against the corrosive seawater. The final recipe for the cables was seven copper wires in the center surrounded by three coats of gutta percha, a kind of latex from the gutta percha tree that's electri electrically non-conductive. Then they were wrapped in tarred hemp. And lastly, helixed into 18 strands of seven iron wires as the skin, if you will, for these cables. The result was a 5 eighths of an inch diameter cable. And all this material necessary to make the cable capable of sending messages across the seabed weighed 
107 pounds per nautical mile, or to put it another way, the total length of cable that they needed weighed the same as a moderately full Boeing 757. Energy was gathering around the idea of establishing this direct and near instant communication between the continents, and in 1856 the Atlantic Telegraph Company was formed with the US and British governments funding the project. But alas, we come to the biggest problem of it all. No single ship in existence at the time could carry such a huge load. So two ships, the USS Niagara and the HMS Agamemnon, they were refitted with the goal of jointly laying the cable across the Atlantic seabed. The Agamemnon was a British ship built in 1849, a line of battle fully rigged steamer ship capable of speeds at full steam of around 11 knots. That's 12 miles an hour or 20 kilometers an hour, not fast. Her partner in this adventure was the USS Niagara, a steam frigate built in 1854 by the New York Navy Yard, not to be confused with at least eight other ships now that have also been named the USS Niagara. Each vessel would have her holds overflowing with cable spilling out onto the decks and threaded through a mechanism on the stern to pay out the line along the seabed, complete with a braking mechanism to stop the cable. It would take three weeks to load the cable onto the ships. Three weeks just to load it. But still, even with the two ships carrying over 100,000 pounds of cable, the puzzle of how to span over 2,000 nautical miles of sea still needed to be solved. Scientists and governments and officials debated a few strategies. Plan A was connecting one end of cable to the land and then setting the ship out and testing the telegraph repeatedly along the way and connecting midway in the Atlantic to splice the two cables together. Or plan B, starting the adventure from within the mid-Atlantic with the two ships, splicing the cables together, followed by the two separate journeys of the ships back to their respective shores. The first attempt followed plan A. The USS Niagara departed the southwest coast of Ireland on the morning of August 5th, 1857. Just five miles into the attempt, though, the cable broke, and the ship turned around and went back to shore. The line was retrieved and repaired, and the crew of the Niagara set off again, with Samuel Morse on board, and he was testing the telegraph every couple of days, and it appeared successful, and transmissions between the Niagara and Ireland buoyed the crew's spirits. But their luck ran out. On August 11th, when the vessel hit a wave, putting strain on the cable, and it was in a braked position at the time in the payout mechanism, the cable snapped in half. Samuel Morse is said to have been seasick during this passage the whole time, perhaps an omen of the entire endeavor, and this time with the cable laying at a depth of some 3,200 meters, everyone agreed that this attempt was a failure as well, and then went home. The following year in 1858, a new attempt was hatched, and this time they were going to go with option B. The Niagara and the Agamemnon set out to try again. This time the plan was to rendezvous in the mid-Atlantic, splice the ends of their cables together, and then sail away from each other back to Newfoundland and Ireland, respectively. But first, they had to battle with the weather to get to the meeting spot. With rolling seas, the vessels, vessels struggled with their top-heavy decks all laden with cable, creating a challenge of even staying upright. During this time, 45 men were injured, but there were no fatalities. And seamanship ultimately prevailed, and on June 25, 1858, the two vessels finally met together at 52 North, 33 West, the agreed-upon halfway point. The cable ends were spliced together, and they dropped it into the Atlantic, and the Agamemnon and Niagara turned stern to stern and set sail. For two days, things looked promising, with the cable reliably sending communication between the two ships. And imagine two ships at sea communicating in real time with each other for the first time. This is a time back when we used to shine bright lights at each other to send messages. But of course, luck didn't last long. Within a few days, communication failed, and the ships returned to the middle point to meet each other and figure out why. They cut their losses, so to speak, ditching the troubled cable and starting with a fresh splice of unused cable, and again, they set off. 
But don't get all hopeful because again, luck was not on their side. Once more, the cable snapped on the Agamemnon and both ships just returned to Queenstown. For the third time, the ship set out in July of 1858. Following the previous year's model, the ships met in the middle of the Atlantic, spliced together their cables, and set off east and west to North America and Europe. This time they got lucky. The USS Niagara docked in Newfoundland with the cable still intact. The HMS Agamemnon returned to Ireland with her cable fully paid out and fully intact. Finally, a line of communication strung across the sea. Scientists on land could now send out the first test messages. With lots of confusion and requests to repeat or slow down or please repeat, the long-awaited method of communication was born. On August 16th, Queen Victoria sent out the first official transatlantic telegraph message to the then American president, James Buchanan, stating, the Queen desires to con congratulate the President upon successful completion of the great international work in which the Queen has taken the greatest interest. And the message continues with more of the same flowery language. It speaks to the struggles that they'd continued with with these cables, and the President's reply was not received until three days later, on August 19th. The days following the first transmission were marked with struggle. Within a few weeks, the cable stopped working entirely. But the point had been proven. It could be done. And so, after eight years of improvements to the cable's strength, its transmission speed, and an overhaul of the cable payout mechanism, the mighty SS Great Eastern was selected for the next attempt. The Great Eastern was a massive ship, the largest in the world when it was built. Her length was 692 feet, and her displacement, displacement was over 32,000 tons. She was capable of transporting 4,000 people from England to Australia non-stop. Her hull was double-skinned, an unusual feature at the time, but it further added to her bulk. After initial, an initial attempt that failed, the Great Eastern set out single-handedly from Ireland to lay a new cable from Europe to North America. Finally, she achieved long-term success in establishing a permanent connection between the continents, landing in Newfoundland on July 27th, 1866. The transmission speed of the new and improved cable was far better than earlier attempts, and the phrase two weeks and two minutes was used to describe that success. All along this very human attempt to bridge the gap between the continents, there were struggles, there were failures, and probably a lot of lost cable still sitting on the seabed. But the effort paid off, and it brought the world closer together. Of course, as instant communication between North America and Europe became possible, it wasn't long before someone tried to spy on those messages, creating all sorts of submersible crafts. But I think we'll save that for another episode. This has been another History C video, and I will see you next week. <laughs>